If you would please stay standing for just a moment. Uh, I want to stand for, have a stand for the reading of our scripture passage today. Uh, just briefly before I read that, though, let me uh, tell you that after the service is over, so after we sing our closing songs, uh, the elders are going to be down front here. So if you'd like to uh, talk with or have one of the elders pray for you, if something's on your heart, please come forward. We'll be down here. I'll be happy to talk with you, pray with you. So uh, I'll have a stand this morning for the reading of our passage. I'm going to read it. Uh, our passage is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 28. You can listen while I, I'll read. But in fact... Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet, but when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> the uh, tragedy that struck the Stoffel family and, and others as well has certainly uh, had, a, had, a, had an effect on us uh, as a church family uh, this week. It's, it's been a hard week uh, for those of us at Calvary. We are grieving and we are mourning uh, ourselves at, at, at the loss that we've experienced, at what has happened. And uh, at the same time, we've been praying for and reaching out to uh, the families of the other victim and the shooter. And so there's a lot that's been on our mind. Well, along with all of that, I think we've all got a lot of questions that we've been asking, uh, different questions, many different questions. And, and I think it's important to talk about some of those questions. And in fact, I've listed uh, three questions here that I think are probably on all of our minds, if not all of us, most of us. Uh, there are others, but I think these three are certainly on our minds. Uh, questions like this, why in the world would God let this happen? Why would he let John and Olivia die? Such wonderful man and, and his daughter. Um, uh, and in fact, let's just say this in the most direct way possible. Today is Mother's Day. And Aaron, a mother, is in the hospital recovering from gunshot wounds. And she's lost her oldest child and her husband. How could God let this happen? And so I think we have that question. And I think another question that we have, maybe a more general question is, how do we deal with this? I mean, how are we supposed to think about this tragedy? How do we process it and handle it as Christians in general? And then I think another question that we have is, how do we deal with any fear that we have as a result of, of what happened? Uh, in the press conference on Monday, the law enforcement official uh, said that this is the end of the innocence for the Fox Valley. And uh, I think what he meant by that is that things that we don't typically expect to happen here have now happened. And and I think a lot of us have perhaps experienced fear. I mean, can we still go out to a park? Can we still go shopping? Can we go get something, you know, go out to get something to eat without being afraid of something like this happening to us or to the people that we love? In other words, how do we deal with this fear that we may be having as a result of this? Well, I think these questions, among others, are on our minds. And when we have questions like this, I, and when I have questions, what I try to do is I try to go to God's word and see what it says, and see if I can find help and direction there. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look at the passage that I read just a moment ago, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 to 28, and see how that can help us with regards to how we think through this tragedy in the aftermath of it. And I think what we're going to see, well, what we are going to see as we look at this passage, is that we can have a sure hope in our resurrection. And that hope in our resurrection, transforms the way that we think about this tragedy. 
that hope in our resurrection, it changes, it transforms the way we think about this tragedy. Yes, we acknowledge that it is a tragedy, that it's terrible, that it's awful, but at the, awful, but at the same time, we have the certain hope that we will be raised. We will be with Christ forever. And in fact, here's the outline of our passage, the certainty of our resurrection. And we can be certain of it because of Jesus' resurrection and because we know that God has ultimate victory. And Paul is going to argue that those things guarantee our resurrection. So we're going to walk through that passage, and then we're going to talk about how uh, we can process those questions that I raised a few minutes ago, a couple minutes ago, of the questions that we have. And we'll talk about how this passage speaks to those questions. And then finally, we'll talk about our response, namely that we remember our future resurrection. So let me begin by rereading uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, uh, the the first verse of the passage I read a moment ago. Uh, Paul says there, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, let me just give you some context because we're jumping into the middle of a a letter here, the the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, 1 Corinthians is a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to uh, the Apostle Paul. If you don't know who he is, he's a famous early Christian missionary who wrote uh, a large portion of the New Testament. Well, he wrote this letter to the churches in Corinth, to believers in the city of Corinth. And this letter, if you were to read the whole thing through, what you'd see is Paul is trying to address several controversies or several issues that were going on in the church at that time. And one of those controversies was apparently that there were many in the church who were not believing in a resurrection. And so Paul wanted to address that. And he began in the beginning of, uh, in the beginning of uh, 1 Corinthians 15 by talking about the earliest testimonies of Jesus' resurrection. And he said, listen, we know Jesus was raised. Hundreds of people saw him alive from the dead. And he, and he noted that many of them are still alive. In fact, saying to the Corinthians, you can go ask them if you'd like. They can tell you that they saw the living Jesus, the one who was raised. And then Paul, in verses 12 to 19, uses logic to argue for Christ's resurrection. And so now in our passage, verses 20 to 28, having established the fact, the certainty of Jesus's resurrection, he's going to argue that because we know Jesus was raised, we can know for sure that we are raised. And look at how he puts it in verse 20. He says, Jesus has indeed been raised and his resurrection is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, what does that phrase mean, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep? Well, by those who have fallen asleep, Paul is referring to Christians who have died. And and by first fruits, what Paul is referring to is uh, uh, the the first portion of something. Uh, For example, this phrase or this word was used in in the ancient world to talk about the first portion of something, like, for example, the first portion of a grain harvest. And, and the idea of first fruits is that this is the first portion, but there is a guarantee of more to come afterwards. The very, na- the very idea of first fruits demands that more comes after. And that's what Paul is saying here about the resurrection. He's saying Christ was raised. That's the first fruits of more resurrection that's going to come afterwards, namely those who are asleep in Christ, namely followers of Jesus who have died. They will also be raised, Paul argues. And in verses 21 to 22, he continues his argument. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. All right, so Paul here talks about, as he continues his argument, he talks about the principle of representation. And his basic argument is this. Adam represented us in that he died and his death spread to all of us. But now, because of another man, Jesus, and because he was raised, now his resurrection spreads to all who trust in him. And so let me, let me break that down for us a little bit and talk a little bit more about what Paul is saying here. First of all, he's talking about how Adam is our representative. Now, in what sense is Adam our representative? Well, if you think back to the beginning of the Bible, the story uh, that's written in the book of Genesis, what we'll find there is that God made Adam and Eve, and they were living in the garden, but 
because of the influence of the serpent, Adam and Eve sinned against God. And therefore God banished them from the garden and they were estranged from him and eventually they died. And so what Paul is saying here is that Adam represented us at that time. He died and now all of us face death because of him, because of what he did. Now, when you hear that, you might think, wait a minute, that, that's not really fair. That I die because of something that Adam did? How, how does that work? How is that fair at all? But if you think about it for just a minute, I think, I think we can see how this works. First of all, I think we all understand the principle of representation. Any of us who have ever played a team sport understand that, right? Uh, let's say we're a part of a softball team. And let's say one of us, let's say it's Jared. Jared goes up to bat for our softball team. Now, when Jared gets up to bat, if he strikes out, like we hope he won't, but if he strikes out, then that will be an out for Jared, but it will also count as an out for our whole team. Even though we weren't up there hitting, Jared was, it still counts against us. Now, if Jared gets up there and hits a home run, like we expect him to, right? Um, then, then that home run counts not just for Jared, but for the whole team. So we understand this, how the actions of one affect others. But it's not just that. We can't divorce ourselves from Adam's sin. We... We, we underline and we, 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 we underscore every, every day Adam's sin because we sin ourselves. None of us are perfect. None of us live up to God's perfect standard, having the right actions for the right reasons all the time to the glory of God. None of us do that. All of us are rightly under the condemnation of death. And so we can't separate, separate ourselves from him. We, we agree every day with his action by our own sin. We deserve his, that death. And then finally, for those of us who are believers, we are happy to have Jesus as our representative, right? We are happy to have him stand for us. And so I think we understand this principle of representation. And, th and then what Paul's arguing here, we understand how death spread to all of us through Adam's sin and death. Now, as for the other side, of the, of the contrast, what Paul is saying. For those of us who are believers in Jesus, what we see in this verse is that resurrection, like death spread to all of us, resurrection has spread to those of us who are believers in Jesus through his saving work and God's resurrection of Jesus. And here's how it works. Paul doesn't go into the nuts and bolts of it right here in this passage, but in other places he does, and it's clear in scripture. You see, Jesus, unlike us, did obey God perfectly. He never sinned against God. And in fact, he obeyed God's mission for him to go to the cross and to die sacrificially for us. And then God raised him from the dead. And let me say a little bit more about, about Jesus' death because what was happening at his death is a transaction was taking place. You see, I mentioned earlier that we rightly deserve death because of our own sin. We, we are under condemnation. Well, on the cross, Jesus was taking the condemnation that we deserve. He was suffering our punishment on the cross. He took it from us. And not only that, but for those of us who have trusted in him, not only did he take our punishment, but he gave us his righteousness. All of his goodness, all of his obedience is credited to us by faith. And so that is how and because God raised Jesus from the dead, that is how we also, because we're justified, because we're in Christ, that is how we will also be raised because we are in union with Jesus, connected to him in his death and resurrection. And so because Jesus was raised, we can be certain that we will be also. Now in verse 23, Paul's gonna talk about the timing of all this. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So Paul's clarifying, hey, our resurrection hasn't happened yet, but when he comes, when Christ returns, then it will happen. Now, before we move on to the next section, I wanna ask and answer a couple of questions that may be on your mind. First question is this. We see here in the passage that when Christ returns, we will be raised, we will be with him. Well, what happens in the intervening period? What happens after we die and before Christ returns? In other words, where's Paul right now? Where are John and Olivia right now? Well, if you look at scripture, what you see clearly is that when a believer in Jesus dies, he or she is immediately in the presence of the Lord. 
He or she is with the Lord. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so we know that right when we die, we are with the Lord. And then we know when Christ returns, we will be raised to new incorruptible bodies. That's what Paul says later on here in chapter 15. He talks about that, how we will be raised with Jesus to a new incorruptible body. And so that's the order of things. We die, we are then with the Lord until he returns, and then we're raised uh, to be with him and to live with him forever. Now, a second question. You may be here, and you may be hearing all of this about resurrection, and you may not believe any of it. You may not believe in, uh, that, that Christ was raised. You may not believe that people will be raised. Uh, you Maybe you don't even believe in God. And, and all this is because this is how you view the world. You look at the world, and you, you think that what you see is what is true, what you can verify, what you can, can observe and, and know, that is what is true. And therefore, it's really hard for you to believe in God. It's hard for you to believe in a resurrection. It's hard for you to believe in all of this. And, and in fact, you may think of Christian beliefs as, as almost childish. And you may feel that you have sort of matured and moved on to a more honest and intellectually true uh, look at the world and at, uh, and at how things are. Uh, that's how you may be thinking of things. Well, if that's where you're at, then I want to make a point to you. You may not leave here believing in the resurrection. You may not leave here believing in God. But I want you to understand at least one thing. Your whole approach to knowledge, the way that you think about the world, it is full of faith. Just like mine is just like the Christian approach that I've been talking about here. You see, you have not left faith. You have just transitioned to a new one, a faith in science, a faith in observation, a faith in your ability to be able to know things and verify things. And listen, the secular world, it uses, the, it tells us these stories about us maturing and growing up beyond these childish beliefs. And it makes it seem more reasonable and more self-evident, but it's not more self-evident at all. It is just as much faith as what we are talking about here. And so bottom line, I want you to understand that you are just as much a believer as I am. It's just that the content and the authority of your belief are different. You believe that you hold the keys to knowledge and that you can determine those things, whereas we see God as being able to do that. And so in light of this, I challenge you to, to rethink your faith, rethink what you believe, because if what we're reading in the scriptures here is true, if God has truly spoken, if he has truly raised Christ from the dead, and if we will truly be raised with him, then that ought to change the way you believe in, in your faith. And we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later. But backing up, do you see what's happening here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15, verses 20 to 23? Paul is arguing our resurrection will happen. And his argument is based on the fact that Christ has been raised. He's the first fruits. More resurrection is guaranteed to come because of that. Well, now what Paul's going to do in verses 24 to 28 is he is going to say that our resurrection is guaranteed not just by Christ's resurrection, but by God's final victory overall. And here's how the argument's going to go. He's going to say, we know that God will have ultimate victory. We know that. And we know that one of God's enemies is death. Therefore, we know that death will be defeated. So we know that we will be raised again. So let's follow the, the logic as we walk through it here. Verse 24. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. All right, so uh, we're talking about the order of things again here. Think back to verse 23. Christ is raised, and then we, his followers, are raised. And then Paul says after that comes the end here in verse 24. It, Jesus will have defeated all of God's enemies, and God will rule unchallenged over all. That's what he's talking about here in verse 24. And then in verse 25, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Now, this is interesting. Paul says that now Jesus is reigning. Not in the final sense that he will be one day, but he is reigning now. And he is putting God's enemies under his feet. In other words, Jesus is actively vanquishing the enemies of God, the powers against him. He is working against evil right now until the time when all things are subjected to him. 
And then in verse 26, look what he says. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. There's the explicit connection. Paul's saying one of those enemies, in fact, the last one is death. And when death is defeated, that guarantees that we will be raised. And then in verse 27, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him that God may be all in all. Now, when Paul's referring here to the one who uh, put all things in subjection under him, he's talking about God the Father there. And so what Paul is trying to clarify, he's trying to say here, listen, all things will be subjected under Jesus, but not God the Father. He's trying to clarify that God the Father won't be subjected to Jesus. In fact, God the Father and Jesus himself will subject himself to God the Father, and, and all things will be subjected to God. And look at what Paul says at the end there, that God may be all in all. In other words, that God alone may reign unchallenged forever. So do you see what Paul's arguing here? You follow the logic? Paul is saying, we know that God will reign forever, that all his enemies will be defeated, and death is one of those enemies. So we know that death has to be defeated. If, if the resurrection doesn't happen, that means death still has some sway, some reign, and that can't be true because God will reign over all. Therefore, we must be raised. Do you follow his argument there? Well, if so, I think we can step back and look at the passage in a whole and see how sure our resurrection is, right? Because Jesus is raised, the first fruits and more have to come after. And because God must have victory over all his enemies, that means that we will certainly be raised again. Now, having looked at this passage, let's think for a minute and let's think back to those questions that I raised earlier, those three questions we talked about. And let's think about how we process those questions in light of what we just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The first question, remember, was how could God let this happen? How could he uh, allow this to happen? Uh, why? And I think part of our answer to that question has to be that we don't know. We have to admit that, that we don't know. God could have stopped it. He could have stopped the tragedy from happening, and he didn't. And we don't know why he didn't. We ha that has to be part of our answer, but it can't be our whole answer because we have seen some things in this passage about God and how he relates to, 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 to evil and to his enemies and to, and to the evil things that are in the world. And we have to say those things. And so let's list them. I've thought of three things here that we saw in this passage. First of all, we have to say that God is opposed to evil and that he fights against it. We saw it, right? In verse 25, Jesus reigns and he is actively fighting against evil in this world. And you see it in all of scripture, God fighting against evil, God working to, to deliver his people. Now he doesn't deliver them every time. There are times where in his sovereignty, he allows tragedy to happen. And that was one of the cases this week. But he fights against evil. He opposes it. And who, know, who knows how many times he has prevented tragedies like this and worse that we know nothing about, that by his direct or indirect intervention, he has protected us and saved us. And so we have to know and believe that he is fighting against evil. And then we have to understand that he redeems evil, that he takes terrible tragedies and he makes good things come out of them. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. And then finally, what we saw in our passage today is that he has the ultimate victory over evil. All of God's enemies will be defeated God will be all in all. And I love how this is talked about, how, how John talks about this, this in Revelation chapter 21, verses three and four. He paints a picture of what it will look like when God is all in all. And he says there, God will dwell with them and they will be his people. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. God will be all in all. So when we're trying to get an answer to this question, why did God let this happen? We have to say, on the one hand, we don't know why he didn't stop it. But on the other hand, there's a lot we do know. That God fights against evil, he is opposed to it, that he redeems it, 
and that he will have the ultimate victory over it. Now, the second question is, how do we deal with this tragedy as Christians? How do we think about this tragedy in general? And a, a couple of things here that we have to think about. First of all, I think we have to call it what it is, a tragedy. We have to say that this is a bad thing that happened. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's horrible. Uh, there is great loss. And we have to be honest and we have to grieve and mourn and go through all the emotions that we have been experiencing and be real about that. We have to do that. And, and I, and I want to add a warning here because you know, sometimes... Uh, Christians meaning to do well in situations like this can actually cause a lot of harm because what we can do is we can run in and say, hey, this is a good thing. You know, th this is good and we shouldn't have to be sad. This is, a, this is a good thing that happened. God is gonna do this and this and this. And, and I think the reason we say something like that is what we just read about God having ultimate victory and us being raised again. And so there are good reasons for us saying things like that. But I think if we don't also say that this is a tragedy, this is a bad thing that happened, that, that we're not thinking about it correctly. We have to think about both things. Listen, what happened last Sunday was awful. Erin uh, has lost her husband and her oldest child. She's in the hospital. Uh, it's terrible. It's a great loss. And we have to admit that and say that it's bad. It's bad. At the same time, we don't despair. Because we have hope. We have hope that we just saw in our future resurrection. We have hope that John and Olivia right now are with the Lord. That they're home with him. And not only that, but we have hope that God is redeeming this situation. Look at what he's done that we know. He spared Aaron's life. He spared the lives of the other two children. From what we heard in the press conference, this guy had a lot of ammunition. He could have shot a lot more people. And for some, somehow God stopped him. If, you, if you've been following what's been happening, God has been comforting, encouraging, strengthening the family. Uh, there's been an outpouring of support that's just been amazing. God has been redeeming it. He has been at work. And so when we think about this tragedy, we have to think and acknowledge, yes, it's horrible. Yes, it's bad. And at the same time, God is at work to redeem it. And we can have great hope a sure hope of what he's doing. Third question, how do we deal with the fear? You know, some of us have, uh, have talked about how, well, you know, can we go to a park? Can we do these things? How is, you know, this loss of innocence that's been talked about quite a bit. Um, maybe we have a fear that something may happen to us or, or our children or someone we love. Uh, how do we deal with that? Well, this passage makes it clear that we do not need to fear anything that will happen to us. What we see here is that we have a sure hope that we will be raised, that we will be with the Lord, those of us who are in Christ. And no shooter or no tragedy or nothing can take that away. Now listen, I understand that from a human perspective, we can, we can be afraid of, of, of our lives, be cut, of lives being cut short. You know, I mean, for example, in this case, John and Aaron, they didn't get to grow old together. And Olivia didn't, grow, didn't get to grow into adulthood. And I think all of us can feel that loss and, and feel that. And, uh, and I think we may wonder, well, what if this happened to me? Or if it's, what, if this, what if this happened to my children or those that I love? And we can be afraid from that perspective. Well, I think we have to admit that it might be true that some tragedy may happen to us or those we love. Our plans and our hopes for our lives may be cut short in something like this. But it does not mean that God's reign will be frustrated. And really, that's the only thing we should, we should be afraid of in, in the real sense of fear, the deep fear. That's the only thing we should be afraid of is God not having total victory. Because if that happens, then, then maybe death does reign. But it won't happen. It can't happen. God will have ultimate victory. We just read it in the passage today. Christ has indeed been raised. He will, God will raise from the dead all who follow him. Every enemy of his will be utterly destroyed. And God will be all in all. And therefore, we have nothing to be afraid of. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German pastor 
in World War II time, uh, Europe, and uh, he opposed the Nazis. In fact, he even plotted to kill Hitler, uh, which is one of the things that got him imprisoned and eventually executed. And um, Bonhoeffer, a lot of people view his death, or many people view his death, as a tragic loss of life because he was young, uh, he was engaged to be married, he had done such great work for the kingdom of God, and, uh, and, his, and his life was lost. He was killed in the, in the camp that he was in just a couple of weeks before the Americans came and freed the prisoners in that camp. And I was recently reading the uh, biography of Bonhoeffer written by Eric Metaxas. And in that, in that biography, he was talking about how many view Bonhoeffer's death as a tragedy, a, a life cut short. But he mentioned that Bonhoeffer would not have viewed it that way at all. And in fact, near the end of the biography, Metaxas quoted one of Bonhoeffer's sermons where he talked about death. And I want to read this quote to you because I, it's, I think it's a great summary of all that we have been uh, looking at this morning. These are the words of, of Bonhoeffer. No one has yet believed in the kingdom of God. No one has yet heard about the realm of the resurrected and not been homesick from that hour, waiting and looking forward joyfully to being released from bodily existence. Whether we are young or old makes no difference. What are the 20 or 30 or 50 years in the sight of God? And which of us knows how near he or she may already be to that goal? That life only really begins when it ends here on earth? That all that is here is only the prologue before the curtain goes up? That is for young and old alike to think about. Why are we so afraid when we think about death? Death is only dreadful for those who live in dread and fear of it. Death is not wild and terrible. If only we can be still and hold fast to God's word. Death is not bitter. If we have not become bitter ourselves, death is grace. The greatest gift of grace that God gives to people who believe in him. Death is mild. Death is sweet and gentle. If only we realize that it is the gateway to our homeland, the tabernacle of joy, the everlasting kingdom of peace. How do we know that dying is so dreadful? Who knows whether in our human fear and anguish we're only shivering and shuddering at the most glorious, heavenly, blessed event in the world. Death is hell and night and cold if it is not transformed by our faith. But that is just what is so marvelous, that we can transform death. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that we go try to die. That's not what Bonhoeffer's trying to say. But what he is trying to say here is that we don't have to be afraid of death. Because of our sure resurrection, because Jesus has been raised, because God will have the ultimate victory, we know that death is simply the transition to our new life with our Savior forever. And so how do we respond? We can respond by believing in our future resurrection. Believe in your future resurrection. If you are here and you are someone who is not a believer in Christ, as I mentioned earlier, I, I challenge you to be critical of your faith that you currently have and instead to put your hope and your faith in God and specifically in his saving work through his son Jesus. Admit that you are a sinner. Admit that you are in Adam and ask Jesus to save you and he will. And if you have questions about that, please come talk to me or one of the elders who will be down here at the front. We'd love to tell you and talk to you more about what that means. And if you are here and you're a believer in Christ, then look to this hope. Remember your resurrection. Remember that, and, and as you're thinking through and processing this tragedy, let this give you hope. Let it give you peace and joy. Know that you will be with the Lord, you will be raised. And also, as you have this hope, share this hope with others. Take this as an opportunity to tell others about your belief, your hope in Christ's resurrection and in your certain future resurrection. This is a great opportunity for you to do that.
And then finally, I think another response we can have is we can worship God. And that's how we're going to close the service. We're going to take these last 15 minutes and we're going to read some scripture and praise God through song. So let me invite Jared and the worship team to come on back out. And they're going to lead us in a time of worship. So let's pray together. If you will, stand with me. We give thanks to you, God, our Father, through your Lord Jesus Christ, because you have raised Jesus from the dead, and because of that, we can have a sure hope that you will also raise us who are in him, and we praise you that you will defeat all your enemies, and that you will one day be all in all. We worship you, our great God, and give you these next few minutes. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen.